Okay, uh, Nitin, finally good to have you on board. It's a, uh, you know, we've been uh, in the community uh, in this, uh, you know, at least in Bangalore, when I first started uh, my journey in uh, creating a community of in innovators, a lot of people told me that I should get in touch with you. This was at least two years ago. And uh, I think we've been connected as well, but uh, somehow, you know, we've never actually gotten to talking with each other, uh, you know, as to exactly, uh, you know, what, what we do, but, uh, you know, just going through the work that you've done, your conversations in other places and some of your uh, publicly available content that's online, uh, you know, you, you really come across as somebody who's uh, very knowledgeable in the, uh, of the space. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it's uh, uh, your work kind of speaks for itself. And, you know, it'll be a great, uh, it'll be a very interesting conversation for me to have. So thank you so much. Thank for you. Thanks for the kind words, Raghu. It's uh, likewise great to connect and uh, happy to do this. Hi. All right, so Nitin, uh, you know, the first thing that really strikes me uh, is that, you know, you've got the perfect resume. Like, I have, I have, uh, when I go through your, the, uh, the, the vast array of things that you've done, uh, one thing that I've always asked, uh, you know, and, and you know, if, if you don't mind me calling you one, a, a type A personality is that, uh, which bit of academic life really helped you more? Uh, you've, you've gone to USC, you've gone to Wharton, but at the same time, you've done a lot of interesting co-curricular activities around there. So was it the things outside of classroom or in the classroom that added more value to who you are today? Well, thank you. I, I don't know if I'd call it a perfect resume or that it even matters. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I also had a very typical Indian middle-class upbringing, right? And so you get attached to achievement and brands and standings and so i think i went through that journey as i evolved into you know looking beyond those things and actually um doing interesting things or you know focusing more on the work that is meaningful to me right um i think in terms of um yeah i, I i've definitely been always a person with a really wide variety of tastes and interests um and i think you know when i was growing up it was very, you know, traditional in the sense of do engineering, become an IAS officer. That was my aspiration, honestly. Uh, but, you know, I got to scholarship to go to Singapore and then another scholarship to go to the US. And it really opened up my mind to uh, the variety of possibilities. And the US education system is a great fit for someone who wants to combine different interests. And yes, a big part of my college experience was actually things outside the classroom. Right. Um, I, I did have a you know, I did a lot of different academic, uh, I pursued a lot of different things academically, research, teaching as well. But uh, I would say that working while I was studying, because as you know, uh, in the US, you, you basically, you know, most students are also working alongside. Uh, by the time I finished college, I probably had accumulated a year and a half, two years of full-time work experience if you added up those hours. And it was honestly by necessity because I was a middle-class student trying to afford a very expensive American private education, even beyond scholarships, there was still a lot of expense, right? Um, but that was a huge part of my learning. And I think it made me, definitely gave me a lot of professional exposure, but also, you know, in terms of my relationships and personality and um, leadership, for example, I think I got, I was very fortunate that those experiences made me, um, you know, someone well-rounded fairly early on. Right. Um, I don't know if it's more or less important, but if I have to pick one, I would say the exposure, going through hardships and the relationships and friendships you form outside the classroom have probably been more important than what happened inside the classroom, especially because career wise, I actually did not uh, do much uh, that was related to what I did in the classroom. Right. I, I didn't actually study finance, uh, but I started my career in technology investment banking and so picked it up all, all on the job in the you know intense training um, I did a economics major right in your undergrad yeah no finance though oh, okay Interesting. yeah i did uh, computer science math economics i was uh, all over the place if you i might say but uh, you know yes of course i had the some foundations for it but uh, but you know i'd not done a business or finance degree and uh, it's it's not uncommon for folks to you know, join finance and international banking without having studied those, but, uh, you know, you still learn it only on the job. Right. So, um, and of course, I think even otherwise, if I look at my path, most of the transitions were very unplanned. I'd never thought I would be doing what I'm doing today. And it was mostly serendipity, luck and meeting 
uh, certain people at various stages and all of that happened outside the classroom got it um, through you know just network interesting uh, you know and that just adds to my thesis about this as well uh, in fact there are interesting startups that are creating co curricular uh, education right. services outside of uh, uh, of classroom and with this edtech boom i hope that you know some of these things are also productized because they really add a lot of value i have another one of those hindsight questions uh, for you uh, you've actually been a fairly prolific uh, investor on your own right and also with uh say uh, a firm like nea and you know you've been on angel list you are on angel list india's advisory board uh, and all of that my you know my my question there is um there is always this pet peeve that tech entrepreneurs have that uh, a tech entrepreneur makes a better investor than someone who hasn't done a tech startup you clearly you know don't uh, you know you clearly don't have that uh, uh you know uh, have that have that prerequisite yeah. needed yeah. you've done fairly well without it. so uh, but my question to you is do you think that that would have made a difference if you yeah start done a tech startup and then got an into tech investing yeah it's a great question and honestly it's something i've thought about a lot over the years and in fact uh, as we see on grass is greener on the other side so a lot of folks in investing want to be founders and vice versa um you know i think the short answer is it absolutely helps and i think the way the ecosystem is evolving it will help even more so i have a lot of respect for people who come from an operating background or as ex founders turning investors and i specifically talk i'm i'm talking about early stage investing right because there uh, so much of the work itself is about the relationship you have with the founder and empathy and understanding you can build with them and of course helping them in the zero to one phase and if you haven't done that and if you haven't gone through those ups and downs in the hardest phases uh you have to really look at the situ- you, you know you you are hamstrung in some way and you have to offer something else in return um uh, i think for me while i haven't done a you know i haven't started a product company myself and um taken it somewhere i think i've been fairly entrepreneurial in the investing sense yes so i did spend i i i led uh, one of any's first investment co led one of the first investments in education tech and then i went and worked at that company i was employee number 6 and uh, literally went from uh, a very plush venture capital office um with a very large silicon valley firm to a garage right. with two other people who were passionately building something and i learned so much because i failed so much and uh it was a very humbling experience to wear all these hats and realize that sitting on the other side and critiquing and opining and writing memos is very easy building something is actually really hard and so while it wasn't a very long stint it gave me a very deep appreciation for that seed to series a stage right and uh what had what that has done it's shaped me as an investor ever since this is almost 10 years ago Right. um but i from that point on i have been very conscious of uh you know the the need that an entrepreneur has right. and what you should bring to the table and um i think if i hadn't done this i would have been one of many sort of ex consulting banking private equity type investors who may mean well but you know the style is very different right and uh, it's very transactional versus if you have been in these shoes even as an early employee somewhere then it, you are not transactional you are you are far more genuinely um, empathetic right yes. uh one other thing i would say on that is i actually sp- spoke to fred wilson the you know he's a great very successful us vc uh, founder of uh, union square ventures and uh, he had also had a career where he started on wall street but then has been one of the most successful vcs uh, and he never started a company on his own and he had a really interesting point he said you could be a great investor from either background but you have to be conscious of your strengths and weaknesses so from his perspective somebody coming from a uh, a non entrepreneurial background can still be excellent at looking the, at the problems objectively right. and not bi- being biased and not believing or assuming that they know more than the entrepreneur right. so when i interact with founders i don't have that you know Have, you know that aura of like oh I, i this is how you should do it i'm simply objectively trying to be helpful and pointing out everything i've seen which may or may not be helpful in, to them so 
I think, you know, Bill Gurley, Fred Wilson, some of the greats uh, in the industry have actually, or Mike Moritz, you know, have not been founders. And in fact, that has given them a unique strength um, because they are not biased in any way. You, you, you touched upon something that I did want to follow up on, uh, essentially saying that had you not done that early stage stint, uh, you know, uh, because of that, you do certain things differently. Uh, could you give me what those things look like today? Uh, is it just a general sense of empathy or has that kind of added, uh, have there been like definitive uh, uh, things to your workflow that has been added when you work with an entrepreneur that you've invested in? Yeah, so I think it's it's largely the mindset, uh, which is things are not perfect. Things will get broken. Uh, have empathy. Don't be critical. The entrepreneur is going through a lot that you're not seeing. Right. Uh, try to be encouraging in all situations. Right. And, uh, you know, instead of pointing out problems, find solutions. Exactly. So instead of saying, well, we sh- I think we should have a better salesperson. Can I find them someone from my network? Mm. Can, I, can I do things to open some other doors for them? Mm. A lot of it specifically I tend to do in, in terms of venture readiness, as I call it, which is really helping the founder think through what is needed to get to the next stage. And a lot of it is involved, uh, involving overall strategy as well as fundraising. But I try to be more hands-on. I think the bottom line is that I, I think I, I, I can boast about this probably on a dollar on a per dollar invested basis, I think I am one of the most helpful investors, or at least one of the most committed investors, because it doesn't matter if these checks are small, uh, me plus the team that works with me, we spend a lot of time trying to be uh, tactically helpful and hands on rather than, you know, sharing gyan at the high level, which everybody can do. Right. Um, yeah. And I think some sometimes it also extends to sort of, focusing a lot more on the initial product uh, and obsessing about the initial behavior before you'd start to scale things. So not chasing vanity metrics, but, you know, actually um, encouraging the entrepreneur, pushing the entrepreneur to, to really keep asking those first principles questions about why something is needed. Uh, you know, it requires a lot of patience. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I think it, it, it also comes from knowing that uh, early stage product market fit is hard and it's an art and there's very little you can predict about it sometimes. Right, right. Interesting. Uh, th- those are good points. Uh, similar parallel question on the venture world. You started your career in technology investment banking, uh, but then made the jump to early stage uh, VC yeah. specifically. How did the change come about to be and what were the things that really uh, where paradigm shifts uh, for you at the time? Yeah, I mean, look, none of, I, I had not planned to do investment banking after college. I had not planned to do venture capital after that. I had not planned to go to a startup after venture capital. I had not planned to come to India when I did. I had not planned to join a new fund at Lightbox and help start it. Um, every single, every single step has been, um, you know, more organic and serendipitous in nature. Uh, but the difference, yeah. So I think it was a fantastic uh, grounding for me because I was focused on technology companies only and tech mergers and acquisitions were a big part of my role. And uh, that showed me a spectrum from working on some billion dollar deals to some very first few social networking companies, for example, that were emerging in 2004, 5, 6, that time frame. And uh, suddenly you, you it, it, was a, it was very, very... Uh, you know, it was night and day in terms of how you would value them or, right. or, you know, on one hand, you would have a company where you may not have revenue for another year, but it was worth a lot. And so, you know, you, you start to understand the fundamental drivers of value in a company, right. but when you go to venture, of course, uh, you know, it was not about valuing companies, but it was about creating companies that would create value over time. So, that was a big shift and um, it's a very steep learning curve when you enter venture capital uh, because it's not a job that you can train for somewhere. It's a lot of it is pattern recognition and it's an apprenticeship business, which means that you really learn all you learn by shadowing senior investors and, uh, and picking up things as you go along and dri- driving, you know, you have to be a real self starter um, and, and have a lot of intellectual curiosity. To, to be able to follow so many different companies and trends and 
uh, industries and have a point of view right so it was a very sort of demanding transition in that sense mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah and i think it was sort of the first step so i kind of think of it as you know when i was in banking i was really dealing with things which were sort of at the 100 to 1000 stage mm. if you would, if you use a scale um a log scale um you know when i started working at nea it was uh more around things which were 10 you know maybe mostly around 10 but going to 100 right and then i came to india a uh, few years later and helped start lightbox mm. and there we were really more in the sort of 1 to 10 stage right uh just starting with series a sometimes before series a and now in my third innings in investing with first principles and in crypto on the blockchain side it's really been more of 0 to 1 right right it is so it, it's it's like a transition uh, gradually i've gotten earlier and earlier in in my work earlier stage uh, i mean in my work got it got it just give me one second yeah yeah all right so uh you know it was quite interesting that you said that there's this whole uh, you know you've got to be an innate self starter and i think that's something that resonates across startups as well as uh, vc uh, which is which is yeah. important to know so now you've got two early stage growth uh, companies and you know I've, i've i've done that at a much smaller scale and i know exactly the kind of things that it does to you and uh, you you still kind of you're not you you are in going through the stresses of growing as much as the founder but you see what they're going through how much yeah. of that experience and that pace at which things move and you know suddenly you realize there are 40 new people in the office and you're like you know this was just one table that how much of those sort of experiences um, pushed you to starting up your own fund you did say that there was no plan so i'm curious to yeah. know the rationale behind that yeah so uh, you know as i said it was not planned i followed my curiosity at every stage um i i don't uh, i don't think of what i'm doing right now is running my fund uh what first principles is is uh, you know there are 40 plus including the blockchain part about 40 plus investments and uh, the first part of it was closer to angel investing um and now it's closer to maybe syndicates uh but you know i have a a captive pool of capital that i can invest so it is a fund in it is a fund in the sense of uh the work that's involved but i have not institutionalized it as or structured it with a lot of overhead uh you know as as a normal fund would be with, because then you have to chase management fee and and all of that um so that has given me a lot of autonomy to pursue what is interesting focus on some themes and find entrepreneurs that meet those themes and try to invest in the best teams that i can meet uh you know so the combination of great teams and great teams is really what uh, i've been chasing um as to your question as to why it happened this way you know i think um i moved to bangalore and i wanted to go deeper into the the early stage cd ecosystem and and the deep tech side of things and there was not a real plan at that point but i started to get a lot of inbound deal flow because of the network and gradually started to invest my own capital and then third party capital and uh, you know to your point yes obviously um, once you've spent enough time around entrepreneurs um, you do want to be entrepreneurial now one way is to start a completely new product you know a product company and i think that's the right choice for some folks um, another way is to do something which is start something which is enabling a number of founders which is pro- broadly what i'm doing um but yeah the 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 desire to be entrepreneurial or be on my own or handle ambiguity had a lot to do with just the fact that i had been around founders for a long time that that's interesting to know because uh, it was a similar journey for me there is actually a very popular talk which we do at this place called bar camp here which yeah. i have given where i'm on public saying that i will never start up Hundred <laughs> entrepreneurs later interactions with hundred entrepreneurs later, then that's, that's completely different now. You know, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I I still think that most people um, don't have to start start up, or that you should never start up unless you really 
feeling something in your bones or something's keeping you up at night you know i i, I kind of think of this uh, uh, the the kind of thing that i am doing perhaps you might also feel this way or you know i i don't compare myself to a typical entrepreneur because i don't have those stresses you know i don't have to make payroll or have a have a um you know have a large team to manage and and uh be consistently judged uh month to month uh by someone right um so i'm very lucky in that sense i think that's each of the founders i work with have that stress um i feel what i'm doing is sort of quasi entrepreneurial i have stakeholders i have to generate returns uh i do have a team and i am definitely working a lot uh 24/7 sometimes to try help all of these founders i mean 40 companies ends up being a lot to help or manage um and so yeah some aspects are are definitely the same but uh you know i i was very clear if 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 something was making me wake up at night and i would pursue that one idea and i think then that product startup and taking a five year view minimum of you know i'll be doing this for five years is the right thing to do uh, i guess in my case because i had done a lot of investing it this this sort of became a middle point between starting something and still investing it's interesting it almost feels like a uh, like what you know most many successful freelancers kind of tell me as well you know they say that you know it is like a starting up but at the same time not to the overheads of right 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 that that's interesting to know uh, you, you know we we've got to talk about crypto and it seems to be this common trend that i'm having with every investor that i talk to is they seem to have some twist with it and you know encrypt is one of the early communities in india as far as yeah. where we are now and uh, i'm curious to know what got you into it and uh, yeah. how did that happen to you in, in this whole investment yeah. world that you're from Yeah so when i moved to bangalore and uh, you know i as i mentioned i was following my curiosity i was very interested in going closer to deep tech and um the two biggest things i saw were ai and blockchain more in the sense of you know big fundamental thematic foundational shifts and uh, there were a lot of people working in ai and blockchain seemed seemed to be still something that uh, not a lot of people were paying attention to there was a lot of hype but not many people were actually dedicating part of their career to this from a you know ecosystem angle and it was also very misunderstood um or at least in 2017 which is when i started to you know earnestly look into it i mean i had like everyone else had read about bitcoin etc before but uh i always thought it was this crazy you know uh fraudulent thing almost right because i had the same impressions that get formed but you know it, having some time uh when i was figuring things out gave me the chance to read a lot and go deeper into the the real fundamental underpinnings of what this is about and and i realized wow this is not just about an alternate currency it's about a new technology shift it's about a new internet uh it's actually how the internet should work and how we currently today are in the internet of information but we should really be moving towards an informa- internet of value um it's 2000 you know now 20 then 17 and we still have so many inefficient systems that um are are partly inefficient because there is an intermediary involved somewhere that doesn't need to be there and today the technology is ready or on its way to be ready uh for a number of these sectors to be disrupted whether it's uh, media or finance and you know supply chains etc so you know i think that i understood or uh, even though i'm looking back i think uh, it's still going to take long, a long time you know before blockchain sort of actually achieves any part of the potential that people have projected for it um but it was so exciting because this was from first principles you know thinking uh something that you know you have to be part of um as long as you have patience and the question was what does it mean for india because you know we are not known to be or geared up to be sort of innovators as an ecosystem right unfortunately and so i felt in my small tiny bit i could do i could play a part here which was first to just get people together and um we started to do some educational events formed in crypto as a community i actually learned a lot from the people i worked with some you know because this space is really about 
uh, people who are much younger in a way i don't i'm not old or anything but you know people who are really thinking differently uh, uh, and maybe in their early 20s and so we started to kind of create that energy and uh, meet a lot of like minded folks who were intellectually devoted to this and one thing led to another and while the regulation didn't help because most of the disruptive stuff of course has to come from public blockchains and crypto uh, being used uh, or or crypto or digital assets being used in the in, in disruptive ways um the regulation obviously did not make that materialize or and will not make it materialize for some time to come in india yes but in the process while we could not grow a lot of that community and like public uh, brand etc we said let's just focus on folks who are the very small number of folks who are actually very very dedicated to this right so we'll try to help a number of blockchain entrepreneurs in india but really go deep with a few and so that led to nuo network at that time which is now juno mudrex param dot network spring roll you know these i thought were some of the best teams that i came across and we wanted to help them so we essentially invested in their projects mm. um and so that's how it started and and uh, over time we realized that uh, a lot of this is a global scene from day one so you cannot think about like crypto in india versus crypto in the us you know crypto is global from day one right. so it made also made sense to be agnostic about geography and and, f- and find great projects that are technically very strong and invest in them right so we backed a number of things abroad as well yes and then the last part of this was that we also felt that to really move the needle you have to engage with policy makers right. uh, because unless that big shift happens it will just be another space in india where people will create value from here but the value will not get captured in india yes and that made me realize that uh, you know so 2018 uh, the team not just me but we, we created an effort wrote a fairly comprehensive report at that time i think no one else had done it and also engaged with the likes of niti ayog and and other decision makers rbi sebi and, and try to educate them about why this is important for startups and venture capital because that's the world that i come from so i was not going into areas around you know trading and and i think there were lots of other people fighting that battle uh, on the legal side but we were we spent the time because we thought it was an actually important investment to make um now it has had limited success but it's an ongoing effort so hopefully we see better days ahead uh, i have a follow on question with your belief in the blockchain ecosystem and especially the fact that there needs to be systems and network that replace intermediaries in order to build more efficient systems uh, there was a recent uh, interview that laura shen from unchained did with chamath paliyapitiya and uh, you know he uh, thinks the biggest benefit of Uh, and not only him there are a bunch of people in that school of thought who believe that uh, the bitcoin is uh, to be considered something like schmuck uh, uh, you, you think of it as a schmuck insurance where you have enough of it you forget that you have it and you hope that it goes to zero which means that the world is still okay uh, but the blockchain public dlt uh, whole uh, aspect of it is something that is uh, he considers it to not have as much inherent value uh, as other systems right now and believes that whatever inefficiency that there will be solved in a centralized way by the time we get there uh, yeah which school of thought is uh, i don't know if it's uh, if it's fair to ask whether what is right or wrong but what is the counter argument to that uh, to somebody who comes from as a prolific great investor who is kind of looking at this disruption and uh, doesn't believe that it has the inherent value that some others see so uh, no i think he's um, he's you know he's amazing and i think he's right about the fact that um so yes i think there is clearly already an established uh, consensus almost that bitcoin uh, or crypto in general should be or can be considered part of is as an asset class and and that has to do more with macroeconomics that has to do with you know should people have a store of value outside of their fiat currencies etc right so because of that maturity of bitcoin that's somewhat established in the market now now of course every country will have its own view as to how what is legal what is allowed but uh he's right about the fact that that is established now if you apply that same underpinning to 
other systems outside of money you know i agree that if the centralized systems can solve it uh, then that would be more efficient because most most for a for a while to come we know that decentralized systems will have check challenges in terms of scalability and usability yes and so if people are used to a certain user experience um or if you know systems can process not seven transactions uh, a second but you know uh, millions then yeah that is better i think so much of it is broken because the centralized parties are not good at solving them so the idea that uh, something will change is also optimistic i think um you know media advertising is a really interesting example google and facebook have controlled 80 plus percent of all the growth that has happened in digital advertising and most other players uh, have become you know redundant in a way yes um now yes they should address some of the challenges but you know as 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 large public companies with massive valuations chasing growth having to satisfy i mean do you do we really think that they will um correct themselves as much or self regulate as much so i think there is space for alternatives as well um obviously nothing's reached that point you know they have got brave and basic attention token for example which i think now has close to 20 million users yes. so things are still super early but i think there is it's great that there is more experimentation and i think we the world should have alternatives on the decentralized side as well and then, then there's the stuff that's happening with um defi yeah which i think will be extremely hard to see how the existing banking system will ever enable these kinds of primitives yes. right uh people are already able to use these digital assets as collateral and lend insure invest uh, across i think that's fairly powerful actually if you think about it will banks be able to solve this kind of uh, user experience uh, or or these kinds of optionalities over time i don't know i don't think it's going to happen so the short answer is he's right but behaviorally i don't think it's going to happen that easily got it that's that's an interesting perspective but on the bank side i guess dbs would have given us some uh, you know uh, encouragement from that side yeah. that maybe there because I, I, after a certain point you know something that grows from 2 billion to 11 billion in total of value in a couple of months then uh, from an investment or money manager standpoint it becomes a fiduciary duty to kind of at least explore the area and uh, that kind of is my next question uh, yeah. you know the ico boost that ha- boom that happened in and the following bust that happened in uh, 2017 i feel has deterred a lot of people from entering the space and has given the given the space right. a bad name uh, some you know downright charlatans from every country have gotten away with it and yeah. uh, um, i feel like um, you know that has driven away some serious money from coming into the space and you can see yeah. that the comparison uh, in the you know venture comparisons for other uh, sectors and crypto and blockchain uh, and how much entrepreneurs struggle to kind of get access to institutional money absolutely so my my question there is uh, at the same time the when the token investment is done right it's it's an investor's dream right like a, at least from an lp standpoint i can quite imagine you know your fund life cycles are a lot shorter liquidity events are a lot earlier these are all things that are exciting for a for an investor do you think that that still given what has happened with the context of what has happened do you think that is still exciting for uh, investors and do you see more people kind of investing in that token method in the years to come because it did prove something but you know it does have its big flaws as well yeah um i think the ico boom like every other boom had pluses and minuses the plus side was just the awareness it raised and the ethereum as a as a layer got uh, tested and and proven to some extent right but uh, most other most other aspects were just unfortunate right i think there was too many scams and like you pointed out it got it really derailed the space um what you see today with some of the raises that have happened or with defi is a more sanitized version of it or at least uh, a more efficient version if you will what is happening today is that um projects are coming up with not just a white paper or an idea 
a more credible team in this case plus uh actual progress towards a product and so they're raising these small rounds first which are more or less like a venture round they may be done in a saft or something but they're akin to venture capital rather than sort of a pure token raise and so th- that first level of screening is happening and uh and then they're when you look at uniswap what what it did right you, what you're seeing now is actual emphasis on creating some value first creating a network uh, or a community first and then distributing value to them the the premise of the ico was actually that you would bootstrap the network effect itself you would let's just get a lot of people and uh, in the first phase when you don't have actual value in the project let's just give them some financial value by saying this token means something because somebody else will buy it at a higher price and so if you have a financial incentive you will be more likely to come and support my project and if you become users you will bring other u- user you will bring other users and you know in a way that's a brilliant idea that if you can actually bootstrap without spending money if you can bootstrap that network by giving people some token which which they think will be financially valuable so give them some financial utility first and then give them actual project utility in terms of the usage once the community gets formed the problem with that was it's completely broken because there was no overlap between actual users of these project project products or platforms and people who are holding the tokens so it just became a game of speculation so now what's happening with uniswap etc is and, and i'm using that example as a proxy for you know i think what is now working more sanely in the space is that projects are understanding the, the so the talent itself first of all like that's the first thing i think 95% of the people who entered crypto who were in crypto and ico in 2017 were uh were you know let me use the least charitable word <laughs> or the most charitable word i mean were just schmucks right and so uh and i think that itself is was the reason why things were broken you had too many bad actors i think now people are self selecting there is a very the people know that uh if somebody is in the space and has been building for the last 2 or 3 years or is technically very very sound those are the people getting funded and on top of that that's one the screening itself is much higher the second thing that's happening is like i said creating the platform first having usage first and then almost surprising these users by launching a token and saying thank you for being part of it thank you for being users here is you know 60% of uniswap's tokens are actually distributed to users who not only don't don't have to be current users they may have been retroactively you know users few months back but they are also rewarded so you know that is the right way to do this right so i think the answer uh, long story short really is that the token will remain an interesting aspect but only for a few types of projects right the moment this becomes another oh let's have 500 tokens in that, i mean that is just going to lead to the same bad out, uh, consequences so in a way i'm actually happy that there isn't been hasn't been like a crazy boom time like 2017 again because while it will help pricing of these tokens and companies like it would actually destroy them for the longer term that's an interesting perspective and in fact uh, you know what you just said about that new journey that is coming build a product uh, build a community transfer ownership of your product to the community through a token seems to be the thing and this is right. something that uh, binance is kind of institutionalizing as a playbook in this accelerator that we're running and you know it was quite surprising to hear this consistently across uh, yeah. uh, across a lot of players uh you know uh, some of your picks uh you know are really exciting for me like for example uh, juno uh, mudrex uh, uh, springworks you know all of these are uh, are actually really great companies uh, and i was actually uh, i was speaking with a entrepreneur in the space who just closed around um, and i was asking him like why aren't the a level players who are entering saas who are entering uh, you know the other entrepreneurial spaces in india coming into uh, crypto and his answer was like people don't want to risk jail man it's quite scary to know that you are in this space and yeah. uh, you know you you get taken away so my question to you is that as an investor right this is a place of heavy regulatory uncertainty very limited business models and a very small ecosystem in itself how are you finding your picks 
uh, in this space and what is it that you're looking for that probably is common across all of these picks that i just spoke about so uh, so so the first thing is that uh, we haven't found many picks to unfortunately uh, you know as i mentioned the ones that uh, that i mentioned i mean we 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 um we back persistence recently which is a, a really interesting project but most of the other ones from india have been done one two two years ago let's say right uh, and that is not i i don't mean to say that there isn't great talent i think we have met some amazing teams in fact on defi etc some of the teams in india are, are creating world class stuff but um i think what we are looking for or what i would advise any sort of crypto entrepreneur is number one uh, you're only relevant if you are top tier from a global perspective so you know i'm i'm keeping enterprise blockchain aside but in crypto you know you we could we still see ideas about people wanting to do this and that in india but look outside of the exchanges and maybe on ramps uh, which already exist and are funded um you know the more interesting things require you to be really plugged in into what's going on now you don't have the disadvantage that you would in other areas where you might feel that india doesn't have that ecosystem because you know in crypto it's decentralized and very open from day one so today you know when i look at uh, juno or earlier nuo right varun and team had they were they were actually thought leaders in in the defi space for some time at least in asia so they were already operating at a level or thinking at a level and connecting with other global projects at a level very early so their thinking was you know he, he just happened to be in uh, in bombay right he could have been in the bay area and you would not know so and same with mudrex for example right so i think the bar is really high for founders who are able to keep up with what's the, the best happening globally because the nice thing about building from india is you get tremendous talent and you get cost advantages and you can really build scalable products from here for the world but in crypto the challenge is well you so the good thing is you have a global market the bad thing is you have a global market from day one so you can't have any advantage of like you know i'll capture india first there is no such thing um i mean sure maybe you can have some uh, leg up in terms of you know if you're on a trading product you can have some community of traders etc but you know those are edge cases so i think that alone to me is a reason why not many people are getting funded or can get funded i think um clearly the regulation is a huge issue still and it is deterring some amazing people from doing more in crypto i absolutely wish the government thought about a sandbox or at least some way of facilitating entrepreneurs to innovate uh, even if you don't have uh, broader acceptance of crypto and um third i would say that the funding environment is also uh, quite a limitation so you know 2017 18 versus today are there more investors in india uh, from an institutional perspective in crypto no in fact fewer perhaps so that's a function of it's all a vicious cycle right because we don't have good regulation we don't have the right investing climate uh, we don't have a lot of great companies um and and, and the, the cycle repeats but the solution to that i think is that uh, once we start seeing some success stories coming out of india for the world uh, it will intrigue people and so i i still am bullish i think there are a few gems in india who can really make it big on the global stage and uh, if you are in the space for a long term like you should continue to be bullish i think that uh, it's it's a it's a compounding problem no so because yeah. there are because there are no uh, there are not enough com- uh, entrepreneurs in the space then there are not enough funds to be deployed in the space and if there's no funds then there is no entrepreneurs and then that thing just kind of keeps uh, yeah yeah i'm mean, a good thing on the on the investment side though right again is you you don't you obviously have to go abroad and there is money uh, there are six or seven now we know projects out of india who have raised money from credible investors i'm not just talking about like shady icos which may have happened in 2017 um so the money is available and there is actually a lot of global interest from investors who who they understand that india can give these kind of advantages and the talent is there um but that's why i said the first point you have to be someone who can speak to that audience and you can who can compete at that level and uh and and be very sort of um, ahead in your thinking um and you know i think capital is not the main constraint i would say 
because of the decentralized nature of the space. But ambition and quality, exposure, and uh, and just the patience, I think, are probably bigger issues for founders to overcome. Got it. That that uh, I appreciate that perspective. Uh, you know, uh, you worked with governments and on the topic of regulations, right? How difficult yeah. is it to get your point across uh, <laughs> during these conversations? Because that narrative of blockchain good, crypto bad hasn't gone away. And no, it hasn't. It really needs to go uh, for. Uh, you know the real disruptive things to start happening at least from india and i would imagine other countries with unfavorable regulations as well so uh, yeah. how, how do you put your point across and what are some of the challenges that you're facing there uh, from uh, from advising the government yeah. so I, I invested a lot of time in this uh, along with the team in 2018 and some in 2019 uh, currently i'm um, in i have inputs into sort of the world economic forum and niti aayog's work um, but but you know it's uh, it's more limited i think that um it's been a good experience to to engage and understand the the, the challenges that they face and uh, look i think frontier technology not just uh, blockchain but you know governments struggle with it because partly is just the senior decision makers are older and you know they don't have the same exposure uh, you know they don't understand the speed that you need so if you are if you are thinking about you know water infrastructure you know you have a certain mindset around how much time things need and you know five year plans and things i think the urgency and speed which is what in our, those of us in the eco tech ecosystem are addicted to right like things go have to go fast hyper growth trajectory should be exponential blah 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 they they don't get that uh, they don't get that if we don't change something every passing year is not just a year it's actually many years of sort of lost um you know global presence lost innovation lost capital lost jobs so it's hard and i think the only way to really get through is when you have some decision makers who are very progressive and can champion these causes and can understand how quickly technology needs to be embraced adopted or regulated um i think the other challenge here is that you know you can't just blame the government i think there have been enough cases of bad actors and scams and you know not just in india globally as well you know if you're a government servant you have no incentive to take a risk on something which still has issues around money laundering tax evasion uh, so i actually think that they have some very legitimate points um and i don't agree with anyone who says that you know india is stupid to sort of not openly allow crypto i i don't think that india should openly allow crypto for anyone we just will have issues uh related to aml i mean to money laundering and tax evasion and maybe even crime financing right and uh, no good citizen should really stand for that and i also don't have the view that you know i'm not a libertarian or anarchist to say that everyone should park all their money in crypto what i have what i believe is that um, a given the global economy you should allow citizens to you should consider allowing citizens to have access to a certain asset class and be to be able to do that in a more transparent um, open way uh, regulated way and second because it's a very big technology uh, disruption understanding that in 10 years and 20 years uh, we will have massive implications if this is sort of the internet 3.0 right so if you I, that's what the point i've been trying to uh, show to them it's not just about bitcoin it's about the internet now whether they get that or not time will tell but the repeatedly what i've tried to stress is think of if the internet had to be reinvented and if that was happening over a 10 year period would india want to be ahead of the curve or india would want to wait 10 years and see what has happened and then open the doors and i think they get that part but what they are not able to do is take that and say okay let's at least allow a sandbox environment or something so that certain types of developers protocols etc can develop from india have access to crypto assets and then not be hounded for you know just holding a, a digital asset of some sort so look i think this will take time and i given that it's also subjudice uh, on certain aspects you know we we just can't say anything 
i think uh, folks like me will continue to engage and uh, show them value creation globally in, in a sustainable way how that's impacted uh, how that's led to large companies etc uh, i think the other thing that uh, they're really keen on is show me stuff outside of crypto prices and outside of bitcoin etc so partly it's also a limitation of the space overall that while we've talked about crypto and blockchain disrupting so many other things outside of bitcoin frankly there is not been that much if you really really want to be intellectually honest uh so you know we cannot use look at the market cap of these things as an argument to the them that's not what the government's job is so i think we'll also have to wait for some real world projects protocols and whatever you want to call it to really become big and uh, and solve some meaningful challenges uh, which especially matter to the government for example like you know supply chains or um insurance or you know um other things in in financial services for example appreciate that nuanced answer i think that really brings in a lot of perspective um you know uh, i have a uh, and crypto funds are of interest to me and i see a lot of crypto funds doing primary uh, and early stage crypto funds doing primary as well as secondary uh, markets trading uh, give, primarily because you know there is this opportunity in the you know, in the uh, in crypto specifically that you can take long positions on fairly new projects in a public market uh, type uh, type of setting what is your opinion on that do you look at it as, look at that as a divergence of focus uh, from a when you say secondary you mean uh, buying yes. bu- buying shares in the market you mean yes but in the uh, on a crypto exchange so they would invest yeah. in early stage crypto startups they would also take long positions on uh, say a bnb or a synthetics or yeah, a yeah, yeah. compound or something like that do you do you encourage that or do you think that that is actually a, div- a divergence of no it's i think it's perfectly fine i i, th- I mean look it's a, th- that question has to do with each fund having their own allocation uh, and you know of course some are just pure trading funds so they they don't even look at um, look at backing something very early and uh, i think you know first of all again like i said earlier you know i don't think of us as a fund i think we are uh, a pool of uh, capital from people who are accredited investors who are just investing their own capital uh, so there's no open solicitation or third party capital that's uh, you know sourced from uh, in, in you know in an open way uh, or in anything that would um, touch regulation so for us because of for example my venture background i am more interested in backing things early and having a 3 4 5 year lo- if not longer right in the non crypto part i do things which are much longer in duration but even in crypto to have that patience is important so th- that's our primary focus um you know if there was a great project uh, abroad for example that i'd never met but had been following and um there was a way to to sort of by a position sure i think that would be perfectly okay but that's not our primary focus understood uh you know on your non crypto investments uh one place i recently found out one of the places that i freq- i used to frequent a lot before the pandemic is a part of your portfolio how does a tech in what's the rationale behind a tech investor investing in a coffee chain <laughs> coffee roasters and you know that to me was uh, was super interesting to know and i really like your thoughts behind how that fit into the first principles of oh. thesis well free coffee uh, <laughs> no actually no i do pay for my coffee there yeah, as uh, you should <laughs> I, i was joking yeah um you know it's a, it's yeah you're right to point out it's uh, it's it's sort of very atypical i think uh, while uh, it is not a tech first play um, over time you know when i looked at a case like starbucks and the powerful brand it could create over time which has been over you know in some cases digital for example has uh, amplified that uh, and things like their uh store experience has been also enhanced with you know the the digital parts of the experience and uh, so i think you know the starting point was not to use technology as the lens i think um we we i've looked at d2c brands quite a bit at lightbox 
and that's a full stack business that has an amazing product typically a great founder uh, a very distinctive presence something very authentic and uh, good economics right in terms of uh, repeatability in terms of margins and all of that fits very well with the coffee business because while we don't call it a subscription uh, it actually is like a subscription business folks who frequent coffee shops end up going there once twice a week if not more and you have fairly predictable subscription revenue almost and uh, it yeah it is very atypical but i think we just found that the team here had uh, created a really interesting cult community and the in store experience has been exceptional the numbers were very good and uh, the big vision for me is is yeah look india is waking up to coffee um, you know it's the third wave and uh, when you look at the business that uh, third wave is in is actually not in the coffee business but as much as it's in the people business right in fact i had met howard schultz uh, uh, once briefly in college he spoke to my class and i remember this line he used which has always stuck with me you know he said i became very clear to me early on that starbucks uh, which i founded was not in the coffee was not in the um coffee business serving people it was in the people business serving coffee right so i think the same thinking i found was consistent with how third wave founders thought and the execution was brilliant and you know for us it's it's sort of like something that grows along with the tech ecosystem because the tech ecosystem is a big part of their community right now so yeah and you know just a, a experimental interesting bet but i'm very bullish on them just sort of curiosity what is your exit Uh, strategy there like how do you uh, it's it's I've, not, i've honestly not thought of any i mean i've had exits i'm not thought of that that question is is actually something i really don't think about because i think great companies i think you either create a good business and value comes in the form of mna or in some cases hopefully you can go all the way to an ipo um in some cases as an angel or early stage investor people buy out your shares at the right price sometimes you don't even have that choice and you're forced to buy to to sell so all of those are options to exit uh, any of these investments and i actually don't even think of i mean i have no idea to predict what the world will look like uh, 10 years from now so i don't think much about the exit i think as long as you're backing good companies and good teams uh, those things will take care of themselves and that's the opposite of what i've heard from so many other investors they say always know your exit before you go into a company and it was quite nice to hear the other side i i uh, i have no idea how you do that <laughs> so <laughs> i think sure that i can learn from them but uh, i i i think that probably comes from sort of a you know late stage mentality got it i think early stage i really don't even know i mean at the stage that i'm investing sometimes uh, you know the product itself changes in the first year to second year so <laughs> i don't even know how to think about uh, exit at that point I really appreciate that kanda uh, and uh, and and also the the uh, uh, the uh, how chels reference is also in his book uh, pour your heart into it yeah and, uh, you know it was it was nice that you saw the same thing in an indian brand it's it's quite uh, let's hope let's hope it goes that way i'll be happy with the uh, with with an outcome like that <laughs> my other interest area is also your investment in a in an outfit like opeka uh, the, i to me this is uh, i i see the sense in it but uh, a lot of people that you know i've, I've spoken to uh, kind of don't look at accelerators as uh, as as you know value creators they kind of look at it as vanity uh, you know and and that uh, you know these are like cost centers that really don't put, move the needle uh, for a startup Uh, what about opeka kind of stood out for you and uh, what are your thoughts on accelerators in general uh, for uh, for anti tech uh, companies yeah so uh, yeah i mean you know this was a i mean the two you picked are the most uh, unusual ones so i hope nobody is listening and thinking like this guy is just backing like you know very very uh, unusual kind of stuff i mean i think the most of the portfolio is in you know i put a link to your more standard spaces and yeah and folks can look at it first principles on the website yeah. uh but uh the two you picked are clearly like very unique and as far as opeka is concerned uh look i think it's a small early check that uh primarily was around like knowing prasanna and uh just knowing his passion and honestly i, I don't know i don't I mean, people call it vanity sometimes you are just backing a person 
and their passion and knowing that they'll run through walls to make something happen and that's all you know at that point um i did like the concept and i really like how it's turned out and the nps from founders is exceptional uh, founders who've gone through the program are raving about it and and just for people who are less aware the the the, the in short the idea was that uh saas companies will be built out of india india is a great market to build for the world and maybe there's also a domestic market there are significant efficiency advantages on the sales on the development support side so you should be looking at many businesses which can be built software businesses which can be built out uh and cater to the us market but require much less capital to scale now the only option for those folks today is venture capital but there are lots of things which can be built without venture capital so and i believe that i don't i mean i've seen thousands of businesses now and in so many cases it's it's a good founder it's a good idea it's just not venture scalable it's just not venture fundable and i've all many times told the founder that you would maybe consider bootstrapping this and and just you know don't think that you have to grow at x or y just because the market is growing at or other people are doing it um this may be better to do in a bootstrap way and i think uh that's kind of you know the type of founder that uh, the sun nine is team and upek are trying to support and they call it value saas is uh, can you actually build these businesses where you are bringing in more revenue um for every for more than 1 dollar of revenue for example for every 1 dollar raised or invested in the business right and uh, and i think that india will have some very large uh, venture fundable saas companies and india will also have some large non venture funded saas companies and which is the bucket that upekha is playing in and uh, the idea is just to give the entrepreneur more choice so for a lot of entrepreneurs something like this will be effective because it's outcomes based this is the other part that's unique about it. it you know i like the fact that they were not asking for uh, a large amount of equity up front just to provide some space and to provide a network and gyan etc right which is i think a lot of on uh, accelerators are guilty of i think in this case they were being very clear we will focus on saas only we will help you with go to market we will create these playbooks and we will tactically help you grow your sales and if you grow your sales from uh you know x1000 arr to y1000 arr and you know they have thresholds for example how many companies will cross 100000 arr uh, in dollars how many will cross a million how many will go from 1 to 10 and each stage they will help you in different ways for a different set of in- incentives so it it was it was aligned very much with the entrepreneur and it gives only entrepreneur more choices so they can now have capital from upekha and or, or sorry help from upekha and uh bootstrap and get to a certain scale before they need to go to venture funding uh or they can choose to not go to venture funding right so i i think that the macro and the uniqueness of the model and the fact that the incentives were aligned were the three three reasons for me to invest uh, this is very reminiscent of i think uh, i think they called earnest capital or humble capital i i, I earnest. earnest capital and it, it's quite reminiscent of that and uh, just to add to your saas opportunity in india uh, i have a very good friend uh, who's exited his company to printo in chennai and he tells me that there are streets in chennai that have uh, multiple houses very similar to what it is in koramangala but each house is a bootstrap saas company doing 1 to 5 million in arr and there you, go. you know technically that is a uh, that that really excites me and, and yeah, that- because everybody you know there's so much of noise around like chasing these massive outcomes and look those are important right that's what creates the ecosystem and those will happen uh, but there are so many other ways of like if we really care about impact job creation wealth creation um and just good products right those can be done uh without sort of these massive venture rounds and or or that dependence or reliance on venture capital so i think it's i think chennai is the best example and there's also you know bangalore has of course some of these but um you know it's a really good fit for the tech scene in india right it's uh, to your i i probably didn't answer your original question completely as an investment i don't know <laughs> i mean i'm no i i don't think that it's clear because their success is dependent on the success of their companies and so um yes it is unique in the sense that i don't have like a a clear metric uh that i'm looking for but you know partly it was a a vote in sort of the idea and and seeing where it goes 
and and more power to you for actually backing something like that that infrastructure is very necessary uh, especially when you take a country like canada right uh, their whole ai spurge of startups that came out actually came from very good accelerator setups and i hope that some upeka is a part of that journey for india saas story yeah yeah no i mean i think um, you know I, i was part of a group that we had small checks but uh, you know the best part of it was that some saas founders uh, actually led the round and and created like the you know enough runway for the for them for the first couple of years and that is immensely helpful because that's like founders paying forward and helping other founders and so one of the best things about obek i saw this year was when the when the lockdowns hit um you know one uh you know their saas companies actually helped other saas companies in the platform um in immense ways uh, in, including some real financial ways that they helped each other that's really nice to know um on the topic of vc capital and coming back to crypto a little bit yeah there is uh, comparatively a lot more vc money going into exchanges in india now both you and me know that uh, the uh, volumes are really not there and the retail investor really isn't at that uh, community don't mind the light okay okay i'll i'll remove yeah yeah that's fine yeah, i'm just losing power and it's coming back again uh, uh, but yeah my question is um you know how do you see this panning out uh, it somehow feels like forced deployment problems that very large funds in the west are having and and in india basically kind of just kind of mix uh, uh, you know being a being an interesting place to put it or do you is there something that those funds and entrepreneurs are saying that uh, i am specifically not seeing so i'm i'm curious to know your thoughts yeah i guess your question is like are exchanges are, is there too much money going into exchanges even though the volumes are not large volumes and users specifically yeah yeah um you know i i don't know if it's a lot of money first of all um because if you really add up uh, you know i mean because the regulatory environment for about 2 years there was really no money so i think part of it is just that there has been this sort of pent up uh, demand and like there is the in you know the retail demand in india and there is uh, on the supply side of capital there is a lot of money outside which has been waiting for the crypto opportunity in india to develop right so i i think when you look at the sizes to total from coin dcx and uh, wazirx obviously is part of binance now but you know it's not a huge sum actually if you think about it it's Even, about sub 25 million at the moment right 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 and and you know it, it, so in a in the in the macro sense i think it's still a very small amount number uh now whether that is warranted by volumes look i think it's um, you know people are who are investing um, and i know some of the funds personally you know they're just taking a a very bullish long term view of india as a market for this and uh, again they're thinking of sort of you know how big can the price be in 5 or 10 years and if that's the case then that infrastructure needs to be built out and that's that's a combination of technology that's a combination of various product innovations you have to do um liquidity um, you know making sure that the exchanges that they're investing in have the best possible prices and liquidity uh and user education probably right so all of this combined you know these 5 to 10 or even 10 to 20 million rounds if some of them will come like these are these are actually justified from a capital perspective uh but but they will not uh, but you know the difference is that you 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 are giving them enough runway for not one year but maybe a longer period because the growth will be slower and uh, the user education itself right if if you think about how much some of these exchanges might need to invest in uh, that itself is a fairly substantial sum got it uh, you know and in fact the uh, first 10 to 20 million dollar investment has also happened uh, just, yeah yeah I, i know i know <laughs> you know that you know that i know we're not going to talk about it on this <laughs> yeah. but i'm i'm really happy for that and 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 you know i'm more money coming into the space because all of them are actually really good entrepreneurs at the end of the day and i'm, I'm quite sure that you know that capital will be put in for good use um you know uh, what's exciting to me is like you work at with so many startups and that's one of the uh, one of the things that i'm very envious about early stage startups that uh, probably being uh the next best thing to being a startup journalist from a you know from an exposure to really right. people at an early stage is being a startup investor and that's far more involved so what would you say your biggest learning has been um 
from interacting with so many uh, startups and something that uh, a people should do and something that b people should avoid uh obviously the question is um from an investment perspective or or are you thinking from more from you you've seen entrepreneurs up close so, yeah you know. um yeah look it's a it's a deep question um let me try to distill uh, 10 to 12 years of looking at this uh, in a few sentences i think you know I, i'll i'll specifically talk about sort of founders in india for example right i think uh the thing that strikes me above all is just how much grit and tenacity matters i think a lot of people think that um, you know this requires a certain genius or a certain background or a certain network and i actually think that just staying power and persistence as a quality of character actually matters a lot more than anything else um there are so many cases of successes in india where the first 3 4 years were really hard or you didn't get the right believers and and if you just persisted through that um big things happened and even the unicorns for example interestingly if you look at most of them um not like some of the very recent ones which have gone to like crazy high valuations in 2 years or less uh but like the first 10 to 20 unicorns right if you see a common thread that actually you know it took them 7 8 years to sort of take off in a real way yes. so i think i have just general point of view that i i think in india a lot of it is simply about surviving for the first few years as a startup yeah and then you that sort of you know you you are one of the few standing uh because a lot will fail and if you can get there then i think the journey becomes easier uh or at least you have a distance above uh you know compared to others i think um storytelling matters a lot i think bringing people into your vision and having um the ability to articulate that vision is a big difference between people that i think have broken through and done things uh, much faster versus you know others and so i i wish it wasn't so much about storytelling but i think storytelling matters a lot um i think in each third thing i would say is that uh, you know and this is something this is something people must have heard what succeeds from 0 to 1 is different from what is needed for the 1 to 10 and 10 to 100 and so on so frankly the founders adaptability and the founders ability to grow personally mm. and you know attract the right people at each stage is probably one of the biggest reasons for success or failure right a lot of founders are really good at um uh, execution and sort of getting started uh but they are they get stuck at sort of a later stage um and so and, and look everyone will get stuck right because these are not these are hard transitions but i think the founders who are able to be self aware and uh adapt accordingly or grow you know are are really the ones that uh, that succeed and I think the fourth thing I would say is that um you know fundamentals do matter and this is a little bit contrary to the second point I made about storytelling because mm-hmm. I think you need both but sometimes you see cases where even businesses which don't look that strong just tell a good story and get funded and seem successful but I think you know India is a very noisy place I think the sub the noise to signal ratio is very high so I would say to anyone that you know just cut the noise there is a lot of uh, media coverage etc about the wrong things um if you focus on first principles of like why your product is needed and and the substance of your business model i think eventually you know more often than not you will you will find good outcomes right um and i i say that because i think a lot of young first time founders um end up chasing those wrong things yeah. and uh, and yeah. i think that you know folks who are quietly executing should be celebrated much more i'm so glad somebody said that out loud <laughs> uh in fact uh, I, there was this uh, very nice summation uh by uh, by somebody i follow on twitter and they were like um, entrepreneurship is a is a personal development journey in the guise of a business endeavor and uh, yeah you really kind of bought that up 
uh, really well. I did want to ask you one more question with regard to this, but you've covered this, and I think this is a good point to kind of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 you know end the podcast. But uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on board. And likewise, uh, thank you. A great questions, and uh, obviously made me think quite a bit too. <laughs> I, I hope so.